The purpose of this episode is to explore common health and well-being issues for people with Down syndrome. This content is not intended as a substitute for direct medical care by relevant professionals. Rather, we hope to share new and important information so families and supporters can be well informed when accessing medical care. Your individual's medical or educational professionals may have recommended different practices or procedures that are specific to them. Do not modify or change your individual's treatment or therapy plan without consulting with your care provider. Today on The Lowdown, a Down syndrome podcast, Dr. Malin Bull gives us the lowdown on the new pediatric health care guidelines for children and teens with Down syndrome. Over to you, Hannah and Marla. Thanks, Danielle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Lowdown. My name is Hina Mahmoud, and I'm an occupational therapist at the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation. Joining me is my most awesome co-host, Marla Folden, who is an SLP at the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation. Good morning, Marla. Good morning, Hina. You're making me blush. Oh. <laughs> well, aye, you aye, are aye. my most awesome co-host. This is, you know, five seasons <laughs> in, so <laughs> yeah, it needs to be said over and over again. Today's episode is a really good one. We're very excited for our guest. Um, as we all know, our loved ones with Down syndrome have to really contend with multiple co-occurring medical conditions that may impact their growth and development. Um, and, you know, having to keep track of all the screenings and the assessments and the tests can be a really daunting task for families. So for today's episode, we will be talking with Dr. Marilyn Bull, who is the lead author of a set of health supervision guidelines put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And this set of guidelines is really just such a wonderful document because it specifically outlines health issues for individuals with Down syndrome. Um, so Dr. Bull is a graduate of the University of Michigan Medical School, a pediatric residency at Children's Memorial Hospital of Chicago, and a clinical fellowship in the birth defects and genetic counseling at Boston Floating Hospital. Her continuing administrative appointments include director of the Down Syndrome Program and the feeding team, as well as co-medical director of the Automotive Safety Program. She has board certification in pediatrics, clinical genetics, and neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, and she is an, she's active in the American Academy of Pediatrics and has served as their board of director and was actually the lead author of these guidelines. Um, and the title of these guidelines uh, officially is the Health Supervision for Children and Adolescents with Down Syndrome. Welcome to the Lowdown, Dr. Bull. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Fantastic. Yeah, this is this is going to be a good one. Marla and I are very, you know, we love this kind of stuff. So we're yeah. just want to we want to really get into it. But before we get into the actual meat and potatoes of the podcast, we have um, a tradition here at the Lowdown where we want our audience to get to know you as a person as well, not just as your amazing professional. Um, so we're going to ask you five secret questions. OK, they're all little icebreakers um, so that we all can get to know you a little bit better. Are you game for that? Of course. Amazing. Love it. Okay. So I'll start us off. Um, what are you currently um, reading or listening to if you're an audiobook person? Well, um, reading is the last thing I do every single day away from the medical world. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, my sister is an author. And right mm -hmm. now I am reading her series of novels um she has done i think she just came out with her eighth novel wow. and their local history novels are regarding our area so i'm enjoying catching up on her reading so cool. her writing <laughs> that's amazing and you're in the illinois area correct no, I'm or in, Oregon. Um, I live in Indiana, but okay. we spend our summers in Michigan. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, upper or lower peninsula? Lower peninsula, okay. West Coast, right on Lake Michigan. Mm. Okay. Beautiful. Very nice. Great. Um, okay. Question number two. What was your least favorite food as a child? And do you still hate it or do you love it now? 
So my least favorite food as a child was pea soup. Oh, and <laughs> I couldn't say that I hate it, but it certainly is not something I would choose first off the menu at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're still not a fan of it then, I guess. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. No one can blame you. No, yeah. not at all. <laughs> okay, Marla. Uh, go for it. I'll, I'll do the next one. So now we're recording this in the summertime and what would be your ideal way to spend a weekend during the summer? Well, definitely my favorite way to spend a weekend in the summer is to come to Michigan and stay at our lake house on um, mm. Lake Michigan, where we have a wonderful beach and a wonderful community environment. Mm -hmm. So that is a, the perfect getaway. And in, in fact, I've been able to negotiate that to come and spend most of my summer here, actually. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Really nice. And it's breezier on the lake because the Midwest gets, I'm from the Midwest, it gets very hot. Mm -hmm. So you want to be by a lake where you can cool off a little bit for sure. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, next question is, are you a morning person or a night owl or both? I turn on at 10 p.m. and could write the world's <laughs> books at that point in time. So definitely I'm not someone you want to talk to, particularly at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> okay. okay. And last question is, what do you feel is the best advice that you've ever received? I think the best advice I've ever received was from my father who I was struggling with the decision about what elective to take in high school. And he said to me, choose the teacher. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And that has held me in good stead forever. Choose the instructor, not necessarily the topic area or the course. That's really sage advice. I like that yeah. a lot. And I could see how that could play out well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I'm just going to, have to think about that later for a little while. Um, <laughs> let's, let's get into the topic of the healthcare guidelines. Could you outline for us a little bit? What's the main, what's the point? What's the main objective of the healthcare guidelines? So the healthcare guidelines um, have been developed to provide guidance for physicians specifically and families who are very involved and like to learn about what they should advocate for for their children um, on an evidence-based level, the specific interventions that will make um, life and outcomes the best possible for every child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these guidelines have been around for a while um, and they've undergone some revisions. How many revisions, how many times have we kind of gone back through and redone or changed things? So the first guidance by the American Academy of Pediatrics was published in 1994. And there, this, uh, the 2022 version is the third revision. Having said that, the American Academy of Pediatrics reviews their, all their guidance and policies every three years. And then they determine, is there, are they no longer needed and can be retired? Mm -hmm. Are they adequate and can be reaffirmed? Or has there been enough information new that they should undergo revision? And so the... Um, I think it's also interesting to note that in 1994, we had five pages um, in that initial guidance. And with the remarkable expansion in information regarding um, healthcare and life expectancy in Down syndrome, the uh, 2011 version had 14 pages and the 2022 version has 24 pages. So it has been rapidly rapidly expanding. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite a lengthy document at this point, for sure. Um, and what's interesting to me from about that is that's all within Hannah and I's lifetime. And we have certainly seen those changes in the, all the years that we've been in this career, um, the changes around the expectations for outcomes and quality of life and life expectancy have been rapidly shifting, even while we've been doing this job for the last decade. Um, so that's yeah, that's great. I'm glad that the guidelines continue to sort of 
pave the way for healthcare for our individuals. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, who makes the decisions about sort of what goes into the document, what gets changed, what gets taken out? For example, now the title of the document includes the word adolescence and it didn't before. So could you talk a little bit about that process? Absolutely. So the process at the American Academy of Pediatrics is that we, um, the committee, the Council on Genetics, who is the owner of these, this guidance, um, uh, establishes an intent to revise. It was reviewed and determined that there were enough new things that we should ex uh, re revisit the uh, document. And in that process, they appointed four authors for that process. And um, I was the lead author in 2011, and they asked if I would do it again in 2022. So um, I accepted that challenge. And when and so these four authors go through the literature and and determine and um, actually I divided the topic areas into my the areas of expertise of each of these persons and they um, we came out with what we called our draft our first draft then it goes to all of the committees councils and sections of the American Academy of Pediatrics that have a stake in care of children with Down syndrome, ranging from neurosurgeons to orthopedists to general surgeons to the audiologists to the otolaryngologists, the ophthalmologists. And there were, um, I, I've lost count, between 17 and 24 different groups that have specialty interest and expertise. And they fed back to us what they felt we should change or what was okay. No, this is great. We don't need to change your, what you wrote was fine. Um, and I was then faced with a 24 single pages, single line pages of recommendations to incorporate and um, ensure that we were truly meeting the highest level of expectations of all the experts at the American Academy. You notice that we now did include adolescence as a specific and, and um, uh, inclusion in the title. And that was at the request of the adolescent um, medicine physicians at the American Academy who felt that there were truly unique needs in adolescence and we should point that out to our readership. So that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. I, well, I'm very excited about the process you described. Um, I think it really points out that it's absolutely not an ad hoc document. It's not one person's ideas kind of just out on a page, um, but in fact covers all of the aspects of evidence-based practice that we would want to see in a talk. And I should add that after that was accomplished and we had made everybody we thought happy, we then sent it to, um, it does go through a process of the executive committee, the board of directors of the American Academy also have uh, great insights into what primary care physicians and practicing clinicians need. And they also made um, not, not major, but definite contributions to the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that, I mean, you listed so many different areas of the, the the profession of medicine that is involved, and it's just just goes to show you all the things that are impacting our loved ones with Down syndrome. That you need a neurologist involved. You need an auto otolaryngologist, if I say that correctly. You know, you need an ophthalmologist. So it just gives you a. a a real insight into how complex the medical picture is for our population and how it's so important to make sure that all those stakeholders are involved in it. And that made our process very challenging. Yes. I I just, the workload increased for sure. Oh, <laughs> yes. yes, absolutely. Let's, let's talk a little bit about why these guidelines are important. We've talked about the complexity of the process of putting them together. Um, why do we need these? Well, um, these are really geared for primary care who every child needs a physician to coordinate their care and be their medical home. And as 
But primary care physicians have many things to learn about, keep up to date on, um, drug doses and immunizations. And there are so many things that it can be overwhelming. And yet they may have zero to three patients with Down syndrome. And while it's a very, it is the most common um, chromosomal cause of intellectual disability, um, it is still not frequently seen by primary care. So physicians need some resources to go through to, to be in order to be um, the, to provide that best care for their physicians. So our challenge is actually making sure that physicians are aware of the guidance and um, how to make it effectively. And I'm not going to sit down and read 24 pages in detail. I think it's also a very good resource for our medical students and our pediatric mm -hmm. trainees. Um, I make certain that all of my residents have had an experience with being aware of the a document and how to use it because it is it is complicated and there are some very important things that really can make a difference in the life of a child if they're included in their care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of the guidelines have been sort of staples or have been there since the beginning, sort of throughout all the revisions. Um, and I kind of wanted to talk about a few of those, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that I was hoping to go through is AAI or L Antal Axial Instability. Can you talk a little bit about what it is and what sort of that guidance is? Yes, yeah, so Lano Axial Instability is a uncommon, but more common in Down syndrome than in the general population. Um, entity in which there can be compression on the spinal cord at the cervical level that causes neurologic problems. And those problems um, can be very serious if and when they occur. And it's less than 1%, but if not treated, re recognized and then treated promptly can cause major disability. So until 2011, there was fuzzy issues regarding maybe we should be taking x-rays of the neck of every child with Down syndrome around the age of three. And, but in the 2011 guidance, the um, review of the specialists uh, concurred that the actually taking those x-rays was inconclusive and not predictive. They do not meet the criteria of a screening test for a child that might later cause, have atlantoaxial instability. So that recommendation was removed and replaced with specific guidance for physicians to teach families and to do a clear neurologic exam at every well child care visit um, to, um, pre, uh, to ensure early detection and then initiation of treatment. So specific things that parents should watch for include any changes in how they are walking, any changes in how they use their hands or arms, both of which can be indicators of, um, of weakness that would be caused by that spinal cord impingement, mm -hmm. um, or um, any for children who are fully continent and potty trained, any change in unexplained accidents that would um, also be a neurologic indication. Mm -hmm. And some children will actually develop a head tilt in which they will persistently attempt to protect their own spinal cord from mm -hmm. any discomfort. Many children with Down syndrome don't tell us what hurts. They have a very, um, they have limited communication skills and they also have a very well-documented 
increase pain tolerance. So parents need to be more alert to what whether their child has an ear infection or um, even appendicitis can be missed in children who don't communicate um, mm -hmm. that pain um, that, is, that is there and they really have a very high pain help. So head tilts is the last thing. And so what I tell my families to do, if they see any of those symptoms that we just reviewed, they should run that walk to the phone and call me. And then we would get the appropriate studies and the appropriate referrals to the experts that really understand and know Down syndrome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that's great. I think that's great guidance. Um, it's it's interesting that you talk about pain communication. Hina and I were just discussing this last week um, and why this is such a challenge being a speech path. Um, it's kind of in my area, but kind of not um, because I do run across students regularly who can communicate fairly effectively around other things. But when it comes to their own personal bodily pain, it's a really challenging area. Mm -hmm. And we sort of concluded in our discussion that part of this is due to what happens when I tell somebody that it hurts and then I have to go to the doctor, which I don't like doing anyway. <laughs> and then someone pokes me with a needle and I don't like that either. And so that's not very motivating, even though in the long run, the hopefully the issue is resolved. Um, it's not... It's not a good carrot to communicate in those situations if you're afraid of what happens after that. Um, so it's something for families to keep in mind that we look for really subtle behavioral changes for almost all yes. areas of health and try and act on those. Mm -hmm. um, another area that has been sort of in many versions of the guidelines is sleep um, and specifically sleep apnea and receiving a sleep study. What's the current guidance on sleep apnea and sleep studies? Well, um, what we know is that parents frequently, um, very frequently do not, are not able to recognize children who are experiencing um, sleep apnea and obstructive sleep or sleep disordered breathing. Those are the terms that we're currently using. And so it has been recommended and really tweaked in this addition of the guidance to say that every child with between the ages of three and four should have a, a sleep study, hopefully with some pediatric expertise included in that process. Now, um, having said that, that's every child, whether they act like they have a sleep problem or not. Yes. Um, but any child that has any symptoms related to sleep disordered breathing or noisy breathing or abnormal positioning during sleep, um, any child through infancy on should have a sleep study and be referred, be referred to a specialist in uh, sleep uh, disorders. So, and for many children that includes an otolaryngologist to evaluate possible causes of that obstructive and disorder and sleep disordered breathing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Hannah and I can't overstate the impact that sleep quality has on quality of life during the day and ability to learn and participate and have a harm, like a harmonious family life. Sleep is a huge deal. Um, mm -hmm. And even when families are like, well, they're in bed for, you know, eight or 10 hours, that, that, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the quality of the sleep that they are getting. Yeah. Um, I'm and really, I like really glad about this change in the guidelines. Yeah. And I like that it's gone down because I know in the previous version, it was four. I love that it's now three to four because <laughs> now we yes. can get on the doctors early on. And I know some yes. of my families have like, oh, yeah, they got it when they were like one year old, because when they're in the hospital, you know, a lot of the times uh, uh, some of our guys have to stay in the hospital for a longer period of time. So they get the test done. But um it is one of my missions in my career to let all of our families know about sleep because so many of my clients will come when they're 15 or 16 and they're struggling and families like, Oh, no one ever told us about sleep apnea. So, so it's super duper important that it's included in the guidelines for sure. And I think that it's really important as you mentioned that it affects learning 
mm-hmm. and it affects behavior. Yeah. And so um, I just had a child last week who mother says, you know, she comes home from school at 3.30 and she may sleep through till the next morning. Yeah. Well, this child has excessive sleep, um, uh, daytime sleepiness. Yeah. And um, I have a picture of a child that I love to show is sleeping with his head on the bookshelf, you know, out in the classroom. So yeah. these excessive daytime sleepiness is clearly affecting learning and yeah. it's a very strong indicator as well of, of, of sleep disordered breathing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think it's um, a lot of my families have said, oh, the doctor says that, you know, they don't snore, so they don't have sleep apnea. So I'm so happy that you have these symptoms outlined because some of them are very nuanced and you really have to like know about them to look for them. And snoring cannot be the only thing you're relying on. So yeah. it's so helpful that I print out those guidelines. I'm like, it says it right here, <laughs> right? Yes. This is what you need to look for. So, yes. yeah. Mm-hmm. For families listening who have children who are older than the three to four age bracket, it's, I want to point out, it's not too late. Mm-hmm. If this is the first time that families are hearing <laughs> about this, you can still go and advocate for this and say, we would like to do Absolutely. this now. Absolutely. Thank um, you. Yeah. And it's the impact you can have on daytime enjoyment of life and learning is, is a really big one. So yeah. well worth doing. Um, let's move to the next one. And the next one would be hearing one of my favorite things. Um, Can you talk about the guidelines around hearing and what's kind of stayed and changed over time? Yes. So of the hot topics that I tell parents they should go home and worry about is their child's communication skill development. And directly, (laughs) and that's after they've gotten through the heart disease and all the other life-threatening things. If we're going to worry about something, I encourage them to worry and take action relevant to communication skills. And hearing directly impacts communication. So, of course, in um, we recommend that, and it is a state law in every state in the U.S., that a child have a newborn screen for hearing and that that be documented in the first three months of life and that every child be referred to early intervention if any hearing impairment um, is detected. But after that, we recommend that every child have an audiogram um, every six months through the age of five or six until they're able to put on headphones and do ear specific testing. Now, this takes a skilled audiologist who understands children with a disability and does some play audiometry and um, in a behavioral audiogram setting until they're able to actually wear headphones and then do play audiometry. So um, after they can wear headphones and indicate that they know which ear and you can document normal hearing in both ears, then we say once a year for an audiogram um, and, and through, through childhoods because children's hearing due to the craniofacial configuration, the uh, narrowness and the shape of the ex- the internal auditory canals, that middle ear fluid um, and hearing like they're underwater is very, very common and fluctuates frequently. So that frequent hearing test to make sure the child maintains normal hearing and then can optimally learn um, uh, communication skills is is really important. Mm -hmm. Essential, I would say. Um, And it's a treatable thing. You know, if they discover that you have some conductive hearing loss of some fluid in the ear, you can put in what are called PE tubes, which are pressure equalizing tubes to help drain that fluid out more effectively, which allows your child to hear and participate in school and learn from a speech therapist and learn from you. Uh, One of the major things that doesn't happen if there's hearing loss is learning by overhearing, which we can't underestimate. The ability to learn sort of from the environment around you is a huge part of gaining knowledge and skills in childhood. And if you can't hear, you can't 
participate and you can't learn in that way. Um, it's an, it's an important one. And we regularly sort of encourage families to go and get hearing checked, especially around cold and flu season when our students are more likely to have fluid in the middle ear. And I want to just throw in that once they get those PE tubes placed, it's important to retest the hearing because hearing loss can be mixed. It can be both sensory neural and conductive. So it's not okay just to get the tubes. You need to know. And in many settings, are when it's ideal if the audio otolar if the audio um otolaryngologist can have an abr in the operating room at the time to know that that hearing and do a, a um, brainstem evoked response testing mm-hmm. at that time to know document yes their hearing hearing really has is normal and can be improved for for people listening an abr test is a test that doesn't require this child to be awake and respond to a stimulus. So they're kind of a gold standard for testing hearing. Um, and they're often done while you're doing something else. So getting tonsils and adenoids or getting PE tubes or something like that. Um, and they're considered very reliable because you are not waiting for the child to raise their hand or respond or participate for a really long hearing screening. So it's a good option um, if your child has to have something else done at the same time. Um, let's talk a little bit about thyroid, um, which is a, an important one and a tricky one. Um, can you talk a little bit about thyroid testing and when we do like a T4 versus a TSH test? Certainly. So thyroid is a a treatable condition that actually throughout the lifespan increases in frequency by adulthood, 50% of uh, individuals with Down syndrome will have a thyroid abnormality that benefits from treatment. Many of the early symptoms of of lean low thyroid are um, overshadowed or complemented by or complementary with just having Down syndrome, dry skin and um, delayed dental eruption. Those things are very common. So the initial testing as part of the newborn screen, which is by law in our country, part of the newborn evaluation, is to have a um, a TSH. That's the thyroid stimulating hormone. There are states here where the T4 is the only test done as part of the screen, and that will miss um, congenital hypothyroidism. So if that if that state has only a T4, we then say you need to additionally do a TSH. Um, otherwise, review of the newborn screen is, is important uh, for all medical conditions. Additionally, and then after that, a recommendation is to do it at six months and then at a year and every year throughout the lifespan because detection to allow early treatment is critical for cognitive and physical development. So, um, and there are people who felt very strongly we should be doing tests at three months and not just six months. And um, there's really limited data that that made a difference. Now, having said that, children who are ill and in the hospital with heart disease, pulmonary disease, in the NICU, those neonatal specialists know that those children are at higher risk of thyroid, and they will check their thyroid more frequently um, through repeated TSH assessment. So that's fine. But at the bare minimum, a repeat at six months, at one year, and annually thereafter. We did tweak that a little bit in this issue of the guidance saying that since TSH is very common um, to have mild elevations that fluctuate, you do it, then it's normal, then slightly elevated, they're not in the treatment range, but they are slightly elevated, that for children who've had recurrent elevations of TSH, we should also check their thyroid antibodies. Mm -hmm. And children who have elevated antithyroid antibodies levels should have a TSH every six months 
and not just a year, but every six months, because they're at increased risk of developing thyroid problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So when it's in flux, when it's kind of up and down and not not super clear cut, then you're recommending really watching that really closely. Yes. I will go on to my last point before Hannah talks about new and exciting additions to this one. Um, But I would like to talk a little bit about testing for celiac disease and how that's kind of been a part of the guidelines throughout and where are, where does it stand now? So the current recommendation is to be, have a very high degree of awareness of the potential for celiac disease, which is an increased incidence in individuals with Down syndrome. It's one of those um, autoimmune disorders that um, occurs with increased frequency. And so for children who are on a a gluten containing diet. And we know that many of our families just select and elect to not, um, to eliminate gluten from their diet. That's just a random decision on their part or, um, or that's part of their family. But if they're on a gluten containing diet and have specific um, can, problems with certain medical issues like um, intractable constipation. Now, constipation occurs in a lot of children. And if it's with diet and and medication easily managed, that's not intractable. So if it's uh, difficult to treat constipation, if it is diarrhea, that's not not treatable, if uh, without a cause, without a known cause, or if they have um, poor growth, Um, Those were just some of the conditions that entities that we would want then to recommend doing a um, tissue transglutaminase, IgA, and a quantitative IgA to assess for uh, as a screen for uh, celiac. If there is celiac, then um, a screen is positive, then a referral to a gastroenterologist for um, further assessment is is important. Mm -hmm. And I think Hannah and I can speak from experience that like sleep function, having celiac disease that's not treated makes children miserable. And we have seen it many times. Mm -hmm. And when that, Mm -hmm. when they kind of get to the bottom of it and realize that it's celiac disease, we have seen absolutely remarkable changes in individuals who have just a vastly outlook, vastly different outlook on life. And they're, they're almost different people. They're so happy Mm -hmm. and we're Mm -hmm. so surprised. Um, So feeling sick and still not telling people about it, but feeling sick has a huge impact on, day-to-day life. Absolutely. And it's important to get it checked out. It's a lot of things to check out. And this is why these guidelines exist. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I think it's also great. Uh, we'll have the uh, a link to the guidelines on the episode page so you can check them out as well. But I love that the guidelines are also broken down into age ranges, right? So a parent, a new parent that's listening to this are probably stressing out like, oh my gosh, I have to remember all these things, but there are specific things at specific ages. Some that I think may go through all the ages, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. Dr. Like Bull. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like there's some that you don't, just don't need to worry about right now. You think about it later. So it's it's beautifully laid out that way where it kind of guides you as throughout their lifespan as to what you need to worry about at what time, mm-hmm. which, is, which is super helpful. Um, all right, so now that we've kind of talked about some of those staples that have been throughout the different versions, very exciting changes and some new things that have been added where all the therapists at DSRF are so happy about a few of these, all of these really, but some of them are really, really helpful. Um, let's kind of start talking about some of those changes and additions, Dr. Bull. Can you talk a little bit about the prenatal support component to the guidelines and how that's changed? I'd be happy to. So with... Um increased prenatal diagnostic Mm -hmm. options. Many more families are learning that their child may have an increased risk of having Down syndrome um, early in the pregnancy, actually. Mm -hmm. So that is an opportunity for physicians to and and community support staff to counsel families um, and ensure they understand what Down syndrome is like, Mm -hmm. to provide them with 
um, up to date and current information and literature regarding Down syndrome and offer a opportunity to speak with other families who are experienced in taking care of children whose children have had Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. It is also an opportunity for physicians to explore further um, the potential medical problems, a prenatal fetal echocardiogram or a specialized ultrasounds can um, delineate uh, possible gastrointestinal problems so that the medical community um, with the family can decide what will be the best delivery option for this mm -hmm. baby. Um, can they deliver in the home hospital or are they going to need to be delivered at a specialty center where immediate intervention by the cardiac specialists would be available? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we're noting um, when, and it's really important that with the prenatal studies that are obtained, that um, a karyotype that's the chromosome test also be obtained, um, if not done prenatally through an amniocentesis or a chorionic venous, villus sampling, be done through a blood test on the baby following delivery, because that is important for guiding the genetic counseling for the parents mm -hmm. and other family members. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, um, the 96% uh, of the time, the um, cause um, a, occurrence of Down syndrome is through a change in the, um, uh, in the chromosomes, but occasionally there can be transmission through family families. So family history and genetic counseling are also encouraged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's such a great piece to have in place because then a family is feeling supported from the beginning of their journey, right? So it's not Absolutely. just after the child is born, but it's helping them prepare for what's to come. So I think it's so great to have that support in place ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, okay, so let's um, move on to the next one, which was uh, testing for iron levels at an earlier age. Um, well, and that is absolutely new in yes. this um, version of the um, AP guidance. We actually did never suggested doing iron levels. We had always said a hemoglobin because that's part of well child care and mm -hmm. because you want to prevent or diagnose early potential for anemia. But in reality, children with Down syndrome are no greater incidence of having anemia, but they are at increased incidence of having iron insufficiency or iron deficiency. And why is that important? Because iron deficiency also affects learning and it also affects sleep. And if the children aren't sleeping and are having frequent awakenings, the parents mm -hmm. aren't sleeping and no one's happy at home. So yeah. detecting, um, it can make a difference. So the recommendation is that starting at a year that they not only get, uh, they get a CBC with a differential and that is recommended by our hematologic specialists because mm -hmm. of uh, the increased incidence of, of leukemia, um, which parents always really worry about. We can talk about a little bit too, but getting a CBC um, in the first three days of life to um, evaluate for possible risk factors for leukemia at a later age, but also every at a year of age, adding a either a ferritin and a CRP, which validates the ferritin. That's a complicated medical thing, but there is an associated test or a iron, iron studies and um, to, to look for iron insufficiency. Um, if sleep is an issue, the ferritin is a very helpful test to have gotten because mm -hmm. there are children who benefit from treating that iron insufficiency um, if that ferritin level is less than 50. So, um, and that wouldn't show up as severe 
iron deficiency, ferritin, I think the normal, it depends on the lab, but probably about 20. But if it's less than 50, it can actually affect sleep. So um, I've had many happy families who after a couple months of treating with iron, and that's not always easy either because iron doesn't taste good and we have to do um, do some really uh, tricky things to get kids to be willing to do this. But working with families and helping them, um, they're very happy when their children can sleep at night. 100%. I'm so happy you mentioned that. Yeah. And the iron's not easy on the stomach either. So for, for a population that's, you know, always having some tummy issues, it can some, some, some forms, I think there are forms that are easier. easier That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. I'm so happy that you brought that up in terms of sleep, because I think Marla and I generally, when families are asking us about sleep, we're always like, how have the iron levels been checked? I mean, you know, from our perspective, being non-medical professionals, we're just like, you know, that might be something to talk to your doctor about because it often can solve a lot of issues early on. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we can cross, maybe cross-reference here our episodes with Dr. Pelayo, um, the sleep psychiatrist who talks a little bit about restless legs and some of the things that Mm -hmm. are clear indicators of iron deficiency. Um, So for people who are interested, we'll cross link those episodes mm-hmm. together. Um, yeah. so you can find out more about that. That's from many seasons ago, but we yeah. can do that. <laughs> um, okay, great. So another interesting thing that I, um, noticed was that there's some DS down syndrome specific growth charts that are part of the new guidelines. Yes. These are not yeah. brand new, but they're yeah. new since the last version. Yeah. Of, um, I think they were published in 2015. They're easily accessible at cdc.gov mm-hmm. under down syndrome. And um, they um parallel pretty closely the standard National Center for Health Statistics growth charts, but it's very reassuring to families to see their child on the chart because they have Down syndrome yeah. as opposed to always being low. The trajectory may be the same yeah. and similar, but it's very helpful. Also, an important part of use of those growth charts is that we should use the National Center for Health Statistics BMI, which has been validated over the age of 10, because using Down syndrome weight for heights are going to be um, underrepresent the overweight status of children. Mm -hmm. So using the National Center for Health Statistics, BMI, at least over the age of 10 is very important. Mm -hmm. And this is where finding out that your child is maybe shorter in stature relative to other children with Down syndrome, which is then flagging you for some of the other things like celiac. So it's important to have a a comparison group. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Which is actually something that's lacking in so many areas, like even, you know, in assessments that Marla and I do every day, you know, it's just like, there's no Down syndrome norm to refer to. So it's just helpful to kind of have that as a baseline. So you can kind of, yes, you know, know. Dr. Bull, you know, (laughs) (laughs) Um, okay, great. So moving along, this is another topic of interest for me specifically is vision. Um, And I'm so, so, so happy that the ophthalmology on top of the optometry, there's an ophthalmology specific recommendation as well. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So uh, there is a very strong association uh, like with hearing, Mm -hmm. we want optimal vision because that helps the child process everything uh, around them and, and develop both physically and cognitively. And the current ophthalmologic recommendation, if it's available, is to use photo screening at every well child visit. Now, we like photo screening because it only takes a couple seconds of attention, mm-hmm. but I know it isn't available in every primary care setting. And so referral to if it's not 
if it's a, if it is available in a primary care setting and they find an abnormality, that child should be referred to a ophthalmologist, preferably a pediatric ophthalmologist, mm-hmm. or for sure an ophthalmologist with experience in caring for children who have disabilities. Yeah. So, um, and if the um, photo screening is not available in the well child care setting, then that child should be referred to a that pediatric ophthalmologist or experienced ophthalmologist in children with disabilities on an annual basis. That exam should take place initially in the first six months of life because increased incidence of cataracts, glaucoma, and um, other entities, but especially during the preschool years when refractive errors and strabismus or cross-eyed weak muscles um, affects vision Mm -hmm. for the lifespan of that child. So Mm -hmm. early intervention and detection and treatment is important. And because these are medical conditions, um, initially um, following by a by an ophthalmologist is is our recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. And we um, and similar to the sleep episode, we just interviewed Dr. Nishal, who's also um, an expert in uh, vision and Down syndrome. So we interviewed him. So we'll cross link to that episode from last season as well. That kind of goes mm-hmm. into all of those things you talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, super helpful. Um, next, I wanted to kind of touch on dermatological conditions. I know that in the 2011 guidelines, I did a search and it's like a very basic mention of skin conditions and stuff, but this time there's some more specific information, just super great. So can you talk about that? Yes, I think there's ever increasing awareness of the commonality of problems with uh, dermatologic problems in children with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ranging from xerosis, which is simply dry skin, which is easily treated in the primary care setting Mm -hmm. um, to other more immune, autoimmune type things with alopecia, vitiligo, um, and um, and many of the uh, folliculitis and uh, keratosis polaris, which do benefit from specialized dermatologic intervention. So, um, that the physician um, feels comfortable with and talking about it with families and then making referrals as appropriate is, is really, really important. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, So kind of shifting gears a little bit. So Marla had mentioned earlier that, you know, these new guidelines have the title adolescent in there now. So kind of jumping into that area, but there's, some great information in this set of guidelines about gynecological and sexual health. So I was wondering if you could expand on, um, is that kind of why the adolescent piece also got brought into the, to the guidelines? Well, I think that we're increasingly aware of the importance of um, adolescence and transition. Mm -hmm. And we can't look at one without the other. And I want to be sure to say to you that transition begins when children are toddlers so that we start developing choices, um, learning health, good health uh, eating patterns, establishing um, the ability of the child to make good decisions and guiding them through really almost almost infancy, but for sure toddlerhood and through childhood. And then expanding on that when it becomes really important when they're adolescents and making good decisions. Mm -hmm. So helping um, through um, menstrual health, through um, boundary establishment, teaching um, and working with young people in making good decisions um, is really an important part of uh, adolescence. And so um, 
um, that's an often neglected area because they're doing kind of well. They're going to high school. They're getting some help and hopefully some help in the high school um, settings as well. Um, one of the interesting things to me was that um, federally it is recommended that uh, required that at the individual education program meetings that every families mm-hmm. have every year mm-hmm. um, that the child start attending at age 14 and this guidance recommends that much earlier Mm -hmm. 11 12 to start and that's just simply to expand the um uh, participation shared decision making Mm -hmm. is an important part of uh the uh, adolescence and um uh transition process so incorporating that youngster in in involved as to the best of their ability to participate as early as possible is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so happy that you mentioned that transition starts at toddlerhood. I think that is a viewpoint that we all need to take because it's not something that you wait for until after high school or, you know, it, it needs to start early. And I think the understanding of boundaries, especially is so, so, so important to start early, like even at, you know, at toddlerhood, really, Mm -hmm. if you think about it. Oh, yes. Um, Yeah. So it's, I'm so happy that you kind of brought that up and that it's included in an official guideline. It's just not the OT and the SLP saying it, it's actually in a document that says it and it's super important. So really, really happy about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we give you some guidance, transition.org, and there are many, many resources that families and physicians can incorporate in that process. Um, um, I think the social story component, which Mm -hmm. occupational therapists are really, really great at, can be very, very helpful as well. And teaching self-help skills, self-care skills, and what's your job in the house? I will ask yeah. the children very frequently yeah. and then my, well, they're not, they're um, not doing, they pick up their toys. No, no, no. Yes. You can put the spoons on the table. Can they yes. learn how to carry the dishes to the sink? Can they use the dishwasher? When do we teach use of a microwave? Those are transition yes. um, entities that um, we should be including right from toddlerhood on. Love it. Shout it from the rooftop. Dr. Oh, yeah. That's exactly <laughs> on my wall. <laughs> You're Absolutely. taking the words out of our brains. Yeah. Um, yeah, that sense of independence early, it has to start early on. And we see that in some of our kids here where some of the families that embrace it, it's just so fantastic to see them when they're teenagers and they're making their own lunches. And, you know, and of course, every family situation and every child situation is yep. different, but it is something to definitely think about for sure. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Um, okay. The next one is a biggie. And we were as therapists, very happy to see this included in the guidelines because it'll help our job a lot. Um, The guidance on the Down syndrome and autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. Um, Can you talk a little bit about why it is hard to diagnose autism? We've covered this in previous episodes, but it's Mm -hmm. always great to get a refresher from a professional. Um, And what got you to the point of including this into the guidelines? Well, it was included last time, but at at the 1% level, and now we know 7 to 19% of individuals with Down syndrome have the co-occurring condition of of autism spectrum disorder. And early recognition of that as an entity, in addition to the Down syndrome, is a separate diagnosis, um, is really helpful for families to know and for teachers as they incorporate and therapists as they introduce therapies for these youngsters. So um, how do we diagnose this and why is this a problem? Well, there's so many, we talk about diagnostic overshadowing Mm -hmm. because many of the conditions of um, features of autism are part of the um, autism spectrum disorder are part of Down syndrome. And it's not just the Down syndrome that uh, we want to avoid because when we can distinguish those youngsters who have a greater propensity and a greater need for 
additional and or different interventions and how we look at them um, management wise and therapeutically, it's, it's really important. So the current guidance recommends that every child Every child be, be as uh, have the same screening starting as is recommended at 18 months because mm -hmm. many of these children with Down syndrome can be diagnosed at age two or three. It can be very mm -hmm. tricky and it does require a specialized diagnosis. We can make a helpful diagnosis for parents, which is a code diagnosis while they progress for that long waiting list that may exist yeah, yeah. for getting an, an evaluation. But um, it is it is important and it is um, somehow the communication skill levels tend to be less sophisticated or, or more severely impaired in children who have the dual diagnosis, um, as well as um, they, on the other hand, they may be more imitative than the child with um, uh, just the Down syndrome. So mm -hmm. I think um, it takes some skill and some awareness, but doing the screening and making appropriate referrals is is really, really strongly recommended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am overjoyed that it, the advice now is to screen everybody yeah. um, because it removes sort of the, the stigma aspect of, oh no, maybe my kid is in this other group as well. Um, and will we, won't we get the screening and what does it mean for us? Um, and just making it a part of all of the testing and all of the screening that happens. Um, I think uh, it, it gives more space for parents to not have so much worry on board during the process, which is quite lengthy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think Hina and I can both say from our clinical experience, sometimes it's very clear that there's a dual diagnosis and many times it is not, uh, many times it's maybe yes, maybe no. And we do this all day, every day. Um, and the, it's very the, tricky, <laughs> the importance of getting a, a professional who's experienced in this sort of crossover is, is very high, um, and very challenging, um, but it's worth it to get this assessment done. Certainly here in Canada, that additional diagnosis often comes with automatic additional support. Um, and so just from that perspective, it's worth pursuing because mm -hmm. we do find that students who have a dual diagnosis tend to need more support for longer. Yeah, and I think it's so helpful um, that in the guidelines, there is a table that has percentages of the incidences of a lot of these things that we're talking about today. So I think when a family comes to me and they're like, yeah, I don't think our, our pediatrician is not giving us a referral for an ASD screening because you know of that diagnostic overshadowing piece. But when you see that there's a statistic attached to that, there is mm -hmm. a likelihood of it, it co-occurring, it hopefully helps in that parent getting that referral, right? So it's just mm -hmm. kind of bolstering that, um, the chance of that happening. So the statistics are always on our side. So it's helpful to have that in there. Mm -hmm. um, the last little piece, um, Dr. Bull, I wanted to talk about is um, the addition of, um, and I'll kind of just read from the, the, the guidelines themselves, but it says acute regression in Down syndrome, catatonia or disintegrative disorder occurring in late childhood or adolescence. So this is definitely an area that's getting a lot more traction, a lot more research. Um, and we're just curious from your perspective, what led to the decision of including this in here as well? Well, I think the decision is because of increasing awareness on the part of all of us that we're seeing this or recognizing it um, for what it is, which is still a little fuzzy, but we know it's an entity. Um, it probably isn't one single entity, but the most recent publication um, has recommended that we call it acute regression in Down syndrome. This can occur in other conditions as well and be called catatonia, um, but it is increased in, in individuals with Down syndrome, and it is treatable, mm -hmm. um, depending on the, uh, the entity. And I should just, um, this is an area of very active research, 
research. I think you mentioned increasing traction, and that's indeed the case. Um, and we really prefer regression rather than disintegration, because um, disintegration implies that there's no, no road back. Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case. This mm -hmm. is, uh, we think, we know that many children respond to different kinds of treatments. So uh, expert, really expert um, intervention, evaluation, and then intervention on the basis of each individual situation is important. It can be very serious. It seriously um, interferes with social function, family function, eating, health, um, just stopping eating um, altogether. So we really encourage uh, prompt as possible um, referral to a sophisticated expert and they're few and far between. It's hard mm -hmm. sometimes to find that right person close mm -hmm. to where you live, but um, there is increasingly, uh, the awareness is definitely increasing. And um, I should maybe point out, this is, a, and I'll probably say it again, but for physicians um, and, and clinicians, occupational therapists, speech therapists, um, psychologists, the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group or DISMIG USA um, is a good resource. And we have a sub work group specifically addressing acute regression in Down syndrome. So mm -hmm. um, as you said, it's a active area of interest and, and awareness and parents um, really can feel very, very um, overwhelmed by this. So getting a prompt um, yeah. referral to help is important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have a couple of thoughts on that. One, when you said um, that the specialist you need might not be close to you. And what was going through my mind is if there's ever a time to fly for your intervention, it's probably yes. this situation. Yes. Yes. Um, this is really serious and also really rare. Um, it is maybe, maybe we're more aware of the frequency of it, but it's not exceptionally common um, before parents panic. Um, but there are resources if this situation is happening or has happened to you. Um, and timing is important. Um, so if this is beginning to happen, you, seeking help as soon as possible is absolutely yes. advised. Mm -hmm. you know, what did you and, um, No, I was just going to say, and just kind of, we're going to be um, this season, we're welcoming Dr. Jonathan Santoro and Eileen Quinn, who are some of the lead researchers in this area as part of our podcast. So definitely check that episode out. It's going to be very interesting. And I'm glad that you mentioned that, Marla, that it is it is rare. It's just that it's one of those areas that's just getting more research, hence it's being more publicly discussed. Um, so it's just it's just good to have that information on hand. Um, it is rare, but I will add that we have seen yeah. more of it since the pandemic. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we all have. That's the problem. That's where it's kind of, yeah, all kind of, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, Dr. Bull, is there anything else that we may have missed in terms of some of the new things you've included? Or do you, if you wanted to add anything else before we go it, to our next? Just briefly, maybe, because, you know, parents are so worried about leukemia. And I mentioned that very briefly early on, because yes. that's a scary word for any family. But I, just, a, and, and children with Down syndrome, Rarely, less than 1%, but do have an increase greater than the general population, a risk of both acute lymphoblastic and acute myeloblastic leukemia. The good news is that most children who are diagnosed respond to therapy. <laughs> and yes, it's a has it's a it's a traumatic and it's it's difficult as it is for any child, but they do they are responders to the therapy. But I think a little bit of that's new, brand new in this document is about solid tumors. And the piece of kind of good news for families is that solid tumors like breast cancer, colon cancer are re at least no greater and possibly even less common in Down syndrome than the regular um, popul typical population. Uh, through through the lifespan, but 
the incidence of testicular cancer is the one solid tumor that is slightly greater incidence in Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And knowing that means that the recommendation is for careful examination of testicles at every well child visit for young boys, Mm -hmm. uh, for boys throughout lifespan. And that um, additionally, since boys with Down syndrome are not likely to necessarily point out or recognize a change in their testicles, that it may be worth about considering to um, designate a trusted adult that would contribute to that examination mm-hmm. through childhood and adolescence. Um, just because it, we do know that it is an increased risk greater than the general population, and that it's a very treatable cancer. So um, that recognition is important. That's new. That's new. Okay. Very interesting. Um, You had touched on this briefly when we were talking about the prenatal support component, but I noticed that there is a section in the guidelines where you provide some strategies on how pediatricians or physicians can communicate with families. Marla and I had a really interesting discussion this morning. We have lots of discussions about things here, (laughs) but (laughs) but, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about our discussion to Marla, but I, Dr. Bull, why was that important to include in this document? When we, as physicians talk to families with a new diagnosis, either prenatally or after an unanticipated delivery of a child with Down syndrome. Even many, many years later, parents with vivid recall can report how they heard the news that their child may have Down syndrome. How they heard that news has a lasting impact. And we feel it's really important that the providers of those messages do it in a way that is helpful and constructive for families. And so, as you would say to every family who has a new baby, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Know the baby's name or ask, have you decided on your baby's name? To do that in, that informing um, with a support person present for the mother so that she has someone to relate back and forth with and then provide opportunities for repeat discussions. Because I tell my medical students, if they're giving news, they've done a terrific job if the family heard 50% of what they said. So giving opportunities to repeat that information and then making sure that we're prepared to provide up-to-date and current and accurate information in a balanced way mm-hmm. and to share what other families with who have raised children with Down syndrome or siblings of children with Down syndrome have felt about their experience is mm-hmm. also important. So mm-hmm. those are just some of the things that are included in the new guidance. And we really did spell it out in great detail. What wonderful research has been done on this topic. And we wanted to make sure that physicians had access to that information and incorporate it in what they talk to families about. Mm -hmm. I understand the pressure that caregivers have around how much information, the pure volume of information that needs needs and is required to be communicated. But I do think it's really effective to ask how much information do you want today now? And Mm -hmm. being able to save some of the not immediately critical things for a later point just gives space for the family to have their feelings, whatever those might be. And realistically, they're not going to hear a lot of it anyway, like you said. So just acknowledging that and letting that be, I think is helpful for families and the people that we talk to who have had that opportunity have had a better recollection of that whole experience. Yeah. And I think so many of our families that we've interviewed or talked to about this 
specific thing of getting the diagnosis. And you're right, Dr. Bose, so many of those stories are the ones where, you know, are not positive. Some are, which is great. Um, but a lot of the times families say that, you know, I just wanted them to give me a positive, a hopeful outlook. Anything, Anything that is, you know, because of course, to some degree, you know, parents will know that there's lots of things that are going to be challenging, but like, why do we have to start off with the challenging stuff? Like, why can't we start off with the hopeful part and then say, you know, like, you know, I, I'm really hopeful that everything will be great, but these are a few things to think about, right? There's ways of delivering that necessary information you need to deliver, but in a way that's mm -hmm. providing a whole outlook. Absolutely. Yeah. And certainly in this population, there are so many reasons for hope in yeah. the last yes. 30, 40 <laughs> years, the, yeah. the amount of change and progress and quality of living that people with Down syndrome experience has changed astronomically. Yeah. And that's a good thing that should be relayed to families for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, if this is something that we kind of um, hear from our families quite often, if a family is having trouble convincing a physician about a DSASD referral for a diagnosis or a sleep study, from your perspective, what would you recommend the families do? Should they just take the guidelines? Like how can a family communicate this information to their physician if the physician isn't aware of it? Well, one certainly hopes the physician will be open to listening and learning from families. And we know that not every doctor has the opportunity or even aware of the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance that's available. So yeah. um, I personally think that many of families benefit from actually having a copy of the full guidance. Mm -hmm. You need to know, families need to know also, that the um, American Academy of Pediatrics publishes um, on their evidence-based parent website called healthychildren.org um, a section on Down syndrome that includes age-specific guidance checklists that they this this tells them what it doesn't tell why so um, if physicians need to understand fully that the reason we want a sleep study is that it affects learning and it affects behavior and it's very common in children with down syndrome they need the guidance and the full guidance yeah. but the checklist gives parents assurance that they're going through the things that are age appropriate for their child at a way at a at a, a well child uh, care visit. Now, having said that, the uh, we're in the final stages. Our writing group has um, reviewed all the guidance and changed the update, the checklist, and it is in final review at the American Academy of Pediatrics. So if you go to Healthy Children right now, you're going to get the 2011 version, but hopefully within a very short period of time, we'll have the 2022 version guidance in the checklist format um, updated. Right. Yeah. Make That's a great resource because a lot of, there's a lot of jargon to be frank in the, in the guidelines that means oh, yes. a lot to doctors, but doesn't mean anything to me particularly. I have to look up lots of terms um, yeah. and might not mean anything to other families who aren't in medicine either. Um, so a nice family friendly checklist is brilliant. I love that. Yeah. Great. Um, and then finally, Dr. Pearl, are there any other areas where more research is needed um, in order to expand the guidelines? Like, I know you guys just did the 2022 version, but like, in like, I'm sure you have some ideas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was just curious, like, in the next few years, are yes. there areas you're interested in? And where? There are several areas, uh, many areas, all areas yeah. that would benefit educational areas. Um, certainly the um, intellectual disability learning components, mm -hmm. but autoimmunity is an area that is of high interest because it affects so many aspects. The um, vitiligo, celiac disease, type one diabetes, um, um, all of those entities require and, and actually happily are under increasing active research. The National Institutes of Health has incorporated the INCLUDE project. And if you haven't heard about that, INCLUDE means that if you're doing research on 
um, something like uh, celiac disease and you include a population of Down syndrome, you'll get extra research funding for that. So include has been a really positive aspect of um, current research opportunities. Um, I think one of the things that we chose to only comment on in this guidance is the renal um, and kidney uh, findings in Down syndrome. And there has been, because only one paper that actually reviewed that um, and uh, we are seeing with prenatal diagnosis more um, renal hydronephrosis. Now, most of that is um, self-resolved when we follow it up later, but that has not been documented. And so that's an area that I think in the next guidance, hopefully we'll have more information and give more specifics. But right now we're not recommending um, every baby with Down syndrome add a renal ultrasound to their, to their newborn care. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, just before we end, do you, I've been feverishly writing down all these amazing resources that you're sharing. So we'll put them on our website. So besides the guidelines, healthychildren.org and the CDC website for the growth charts, are there any other resources you would like to recommend to our listeners? Well, the guidance gives um, quite a few Fantastic. references, and we divided them, um, and you're certainly welcome to copy them and paste them into your website for sure. Great. They We divided them by age group from prenatal and infancy, including the lettercase.org document that mm -hmm. describes Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, we also uh, gave some printed referrals. Um, and then there's, there's childhood and um, some of the behavior resources that are available for families. And of course, adolescents with um, Got Transition, the Boys and Girls Guides to Growing Up by Terry Quavenhoven, mm -hmm. and then um, the Transition Handbook. And then across the world, across the spectrum, um, the um, uh, DS Connect is mm -hmm. really something I'd mm -hmm. strongly urge families mm -hmm. spend the 20 minutes, sign their babies up and uh, children and young adults and self-advocates can sign up. It's in English and it's, and it's in Spanish so they can toggle back and forth. It gives the growth charts so that they have their child's measurements. They can actually plot their own child on the Down syndrome specific growth charts. And of course, the National Down Syndrome Congress, the National Down Syndrome Society, um, Family Voices, and the Canadian Down Syndrome Society has a great set of resources for education, particularly education, I think. So that and others are included in our list in the um, healthcare guidance. Beautiful. Super helpful. And I was just going to mention for our listeners that might be um, that our parents are caregivers of adults with Down syndrome, there is a set of healthcare guidelines for the adults. So hopefully we'll be able to um, have either Dr. George Capone or somebody from that um, guidance to help. But there there is definitely we'll put this on our website as well for families to have a um, to reference, but uh, there's definitely some things to think about as our loved ones are getting older as well. So yes. we will include that. But yes. um, Dr. Bull, we want to thank you so much for giving us your time. It has been really, really helpful for us as therapists to learn from you. And I'm sure our families are part empowered, maybe a little bit like, you know, stressed, but that's okay. We're here to support them because there's a lot of things to think about, but it's all there for you. So uh, we thank you so much for, for taking the time. Well, you're doing wonderful things and uh, your podcasts are, are great. And I appreciate the opportunity to have contributed in some small way. So oh, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so, thank much. so much. Thanks.